Hello, everybody. I, thought, I hope you're enjoying your lunch. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the consequences of policies because this is broadly what we are uh, talking about uh, under the banner of estimating the costs of drug policies. Um, so I'll briefly focus on a few examples from our region how the drug policies actually impact the health and the rights of people who use drugs. And it makes fairly easy for me to talk about that because I come from the region where we have the highest number of people injecting drugs. And we have also the most uh, prevalent HIV epidemic. Could you, Steve, please? Next. So um, in terms of uh, applying the count the costs ideas uh, to the region, what we can do is ask whether the policies that the countries pursue have any kind of positive or, for that matter, negative effect. So let me start, first of all, with Russia, the country w which has the highest population of people that inject drugs and one of the highest HIV preven uh, prevalence rates among injecting drug users. Um, also, hepatitis C um, infection is reaching about 90% uh, uh, among the people that use drugs, which in itself is an indication that some, something is not working. So let me just guide you very briefly on what is the policy response to that. Despite that, that uh, there is half a million people living with HIV and most of them, up to 80% would get HIV uh, related to unsafe sharing of injecting equipment. Uh, right now, um, the budget for HIV uh, in Russia is about uh, 600, um, 650 uh, thousand million dollars. And uh, this is for the period for each year from 2011 to 2013. And if we see how much of this money goes for the prevention of further health-related harms, we will see that uh, less than 3% and further in time only 1% would go for HIV prevention. We can see clearly that that amount of money won't be enough to provide efficiently even HIV tests, which means that less people will be diagnosed with HIV and therefore enrolled in um, HIV treatment. So that's sort of to illustrate how the prevention work is done in Russia. There is also no federal funds for needle exchange programs. All the programs that are um, working in countries in, in the country, they are sustained only on the international funds. And this is happening at a time when Russia, for example, provides to UNODC a grant of more than, what was it, $500 million. Um, and just basically by the end of 2012, when the Global Fund leaves the country, there will be no harm reduction in the country at all. So, um, and the Ministry of Health has a very clear policy message. It says that uh, there is no need for needle exchange as there is effective state policy. Um, and uh, if we look at the policy, um, at the end of 2010, the new drug strategy was approved in the country um, and what it does, it actually refers only briefly, like in two places, to such uh, drug-related harms as HIV, hepatitis C, or TB. And it actually um, stipulates that the main objective of Russian drug policy is to form negative um, approach in the society towards drugs, which means that almost two million people that are injecting drugs in the country are somewhat alienated, discriminated against, and, feel, uh, and will uh, feel stigmatized by the official policies. Uh, moreover, the, uh, the drug strategy that is now approved in Russia 
It, concern, it considers harm reduction being a risk to the implementation of the policies, of the official policies, which, as I mentioned, has the goal of forming negative attitude towards drugs. So here, most probably, as we gather in Vienna, and what we can talk about is how um, countries comply with their international commitments. Um, we don't need another eight years, which will take to evaluate the new political declaration, which was adopted in 2009, to see that Russia won't reach the objectives of effectively uh, forming drug demand uh, policies. And that's the call that we have to use because none of us, since we are not Russian and we don't work for Russian government, none of us can, hurl, can hold Russia accountable for the, for the fact that actually drug policies go against the constitution of the country which, which foresees health, health and well-being for all its citizens. Um, <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, the official approach is this zero tolerance towards drugs. And another slide, please. Oh, okay. Because I, I cannot see them from here. Sorry. Um, so, what, uh, in terms of applying county cost uh, ideas uh, or approach, um, we should ask, well, what kind of positive effect, what kind of effect such uh, zero tolerance policies can have? And already now we can see that uh, the negative attitude towards people that use drugs and towards heroin, which is followed by extensive law enforcement um, against people that use drugs, and also um, over stress and over uh, stress of um, drug supply reduction, what we see is right now in the country a lot of people would switch from heroin, which is less accessible and which is uh, expensive and which is of bad quality. A lot of people would switch to the semi-legal drugs, meaning the drugs that can be prepared using the substances that they can uh, get in the pharmacies, for example. And what we see is that it further increases the risks, risks of HIV infection because usually those people would inject more often than they would inject uh, heroin. And what we see is that there is no means to prevent HIV infections because there is no harm reduction in the country, no needle exchange that uh, programs supported by the country. So what we see here is that um, the policies actually have more negative effect and instead of looking at the social, economic and cultural um, means that, that might drive the epidemic of injecting, um, there is um, sort of discontent between the means that, uh, that the country would imply and the effects that it would have. Um, and now moving to another country, yes, Georgia. Um, here let me tell you a little bit about how um, Georgia approaches the drug policies. And here uh, it's most probably worth mentioning that Georgia is one of the Soviet countries that was first to introduce the um, registry of drug users. During the Soviet times it was one of the countries that had one of the most harsh policies based in fear and punishment. So um, if we ha can, could find one word to define the policies of Georgia, we can call it the policies of fear. Because what they do is they think that if they would criminalize use, they would prevent young people from further using drugs, and that's the official position of the government. So how is it ex expressed? In terms of political means, it's put into practice by um, testing people on the streets for drug um, use. Um, and random street drug testing, which uh, has more than 50,000 people tested for each year, um, which cost to the country on more than 
10 million dollars. Um, the same amount, actually, almost 10 and a half million dollars, is collected in fines from those people that attest that are tested positive. Um, in comparison, um, harm reduction uh, measures reaches about 5 to 10 percent of people that use drugs, meaning that there is much less investment in health-based services than into law enforcement. Um, and more money overall is spent on the forced uh, testing of people on the streets than altogether into drug prevention and HIV prevention together. Um, and let me just quote uh, how it's justified. Um, the high level official, which I was asked not to disclose, um, said that if drug users are able to fund their habit, why should not we force them to contribute to the state budget as well? Apparently, the government thinks that if you contribute to, to the government, you don't necessarily have to get anything in return because there is no harm reduction that could reach most of the people that use drugs. Um, but let's say, well, that's okay, we have this logic. Uh, the government collects and finds almost the same amount that is spent then on testing. So the next question to ask is, what is the effect and what is the result of such policies? Does it work? Does the policy of fear of people fearing to get caught affect the injecting behaviors? So uh, what the study done in Georgia found, which had like uh, 500 drug users interviewed. It found that it actually had no significant influence on their drug-related behaviors. If they were caught in the street and put into prison, they would continue with their drug use because even if they are put into prison, there is no health services provided in prison. Um, of course, we can talk a lot uh, about more human dimensions such as stigma and discrimination of the people that have put into prisons only for their drug use. Um, of course, it's overburden of the judicial system. In the four years that this uh, random street drug, drug testing was implemented, they estimated 25% of pris prisoners that serve sentence, they, save, uh, they save, serve sentence for drug offenses, and majority of them are drug users. Uh, within the last years, the prison population has increased five times. And Georgia now is second among the former Soviet Union countries, second also to Russia, uh, for the imprisonment rates. Um, more than 1,000 people is imprisoned each year based on this street drug testing. And there is actually no harm reduction services in the prison, so they're left at even increased risk uh, for their health. And um, talking about very practical thing, is we can estimate that patrol policemen that collect uh, drug users in the street would spend more than one day for one, per one drug user to uh, get that person to police, to test, the, to test them and to proceed the papers to the court. So here we can ask whether it's the most uh, sort of violent crime that affects the public security and public safety that, the, that we want the police to spend their time on. And if we look into it uh, even more, then we can see that um, people that have to pay uh, fines for their drug use, and fines, if the person is caught for the first time, he has to pay uh, 500 Georgian lari, which is almost twice of the average uh, salary. So most of the people that will have to pay fines, uh, about 85% of those that responded, they said that they would go, uh, whether well, would have to get engaged in the criminal activity to get the money to pay the fines so they wouldn't have to go to prison, or they would um, sometimes even sell family properties and had to live on the streets as a result of this. Um, and last, okay, sorry, I cannot see what's there. Um, 
The last country, I think, uh, if we talk about the um, uh, policy approaches, the one that is more or less suitable for most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, those countries that sort of have two different policy streams. Um, here I will talk specifically about Ukraine, which, is ha which has the highest HIV prevalence um, in the region. Um, 1.4% of the whole Ukraine population is estimated to be living with HIV, and most of them get infected through sharing of uh, injecting equipment. So um, the logic here is that uh, on one side, the government wants to fight the uh, unintended consequences for health, uh, and um, on one side, the government struggles with those health consequences. For example, if we take Ukraine, um, the budget that is spent on HIV and AIDS is increasing um, vastly. Um, but if we once again look on how much is spent for the prevention measures, we'll see that it's less than 1% of all actual spendings. And we have numbers that is actually is either spent from the government, from the budget for 2009 and 2010, and the plan number for 2011, and we can, you can see that there are some funds left. It's not like the government doesn't have any more money for prevention, for efficient prevention, but they just don't ascribe that money for the prevention. So um, at the same time, with the help of the Global Fund, um, there is exceeding services available for drug users, such as substitution treatment and harm reduction services you can see that the um, number of people that get substitution treatment is increasing, as well as the overall capacity of services to reach the people that use drugs is increasing. Um, next one. Um, then on the other hand, there is those structures in the country that would prevent any kind of positive effect of those spendings and those services paid by the government and by the Global Fund in this case, so that it would reach a positive effect on health. So let me just uh, briefly tell you what's going on um, in parallel to that. Um, in September of 2010, a new concept of drug policy was um, approved and it doesn't have any mention about treatment um, for, uh, on measures for treatment of drug dependency. Moreover, in October of 2010, we witnessed the decrease of uh, amounts of drugs for personal possession. Um, and now it means, uh, looking at the judicial practice, we can see that even the traces of drugs left in needles can be used in courts to put people in prisons. That means that despite the increasing investment into the fight against the consequences um, of drug use, um, what's going on that in parallel those people uh, won't access the service because they would be put into prisons, they would be afraid to go and get help and would be afraid to go and obtain the health services because they would be afraid to get arrested. Um, so briefly, I think um, I just wanted to highlight how the logics of different policies work in the region. And um, last point, what I want to say as we talk here on the, in Vienna about the international conventions, I think for us the rationale behind the 50 years on drugs and why we need to uh, reconsider whether the drug conventions matches the needs now, is very simple for us who are promoting the rights and the health of people who use drugs. It's very simple. They were developed right bef before the HIV and, and hepatitis and other infections and other drug-related harms were known to us. 
And now it's, there is enough evidence if we use the argument for health impact of the policies, we can see uh, why um, the current international drug regime doesn't work and doesn't respond to those needs anymore. Thank you.